What is up? Welcome back to the Four Eight Men Podcast. Today is a very special guest. He is someone that I've been having, uh, I've been trying to get on for a good while now, and I'm so thankful that we were finally able to make it happen. Craig Rochelle, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Christian, I'm honored to be on with you, man. Let's uh, let's have some fun together. Let's dive in. Well, if you're listening and you, uh, you've you seen Craig, well, you, you probably have seen him before, but if you don't know him, he's a husband, a father, a uh, podcaster, a pastor, an author, an entrepreneur. There's really so many things that you do, and uh, Craig, I'm just so excited for our conversation today. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Well, if you uh, if you if you see you, you're a uh, super fit, and you're um, you know you're a middle aged man, but you're super fit. You're super active, has uh, playing sports and just uh, you know physical like physical exercise always been something that you've been gravitated towards. Yeah, it. it uh, my dad was he was a minor league pro baseball player, and so I, I say I came out of the womb playing baseball. You know, sports was was always a big part of my life, and then. Uh, later on, it became not just something that I enjoyed, but it, it kind of became something that is more of a spiritual discipline to me that uh, taking care of what God has given us isn't just something we do for fun or just to, you know, just because we want to be in good shape. But it was it uh, kind of converted from doing it because it was uh, enjoyable and and a normal part of life to something that I feel like is uh is good stewardship and and so it's it's uh, still important to me as a middle-aged guy thank you for not calling me old <laughs> well you're definitely not old. well you really are like if i think about because you're are you, are you 50 you're are you you're 50 aren't you i'm 55 55 now. yep well i was yep. gonna say i think you're the most jacked 55 year old i know and on top of that <laughs> you're a pastor so there's not many 55 year old pastors who are just completely shredded and can, oh, thanks, can, can still outlift someone probably that, that that's my age. And yeah, well, I lifted with you. I think you're pretty dang strong. So, <laughs> well, I hope I'm I hope I'm as strong as you are when I'm 55. Um, and Craig, you know, you know, we we just kind of talked about working out together, and something that you said when we were working out together really stuck with me. You know, you said that you're you're really not a disciplined person, but you you make yourself be disciplined. Mm-hmm. And so for you, how do you feel like that? Uh, you know. How do you feel like that plays out, and what what are ways that you make yourself be disciplined with you, you know, not being a disciplined person, but right. for, you know, but but making yourself practice that? Yeah. So, uh, kind of to back a little backstory on on that conversation. You know, a lot of people will just say to me, kind of like what they may say to you, like, "Oh, you're just such a naturally disciplined person," and they say that because what they observe is um, generally healthier disciplines. And so, what I try to help them understand is that that I don't think there's hardly anybody that's naturally disciplined because theologically, you know, we're, we're sinners. <laughs> that mm-hmm. means we tend to do the wrong thing, uh, by nature, not necessarily the right thing. And so I'm just like, I, honestly, I would rather it's like sleep late, um, eat donuts, eat chocolate, be lazy by, by nature. I'm not disciplined, but what's happened is I've, I've worked to choose discipline over and over and over again. And that's changed my mindset. So I would say, if you'd asked me earlier on, are you disciplined? I said, no, but I'm trying to be. If you ask me now, I'd say I am incredibly, indescribably disciplined and want to become even more disciplined because it's it's such an important part of, uh, of my faith and leadership. So it's uh, by nature, I don't think any of us start there, but we choose. And kind of as James Clear said in his amazing book, ba- basically when you do a certain habit over and over again, each time you do the right thing, it's a tiny vote in favor of the person you want to become. And if you vote enough times, like I choose the right thing, I eat the right thing, I work out, I have the right conversations, whatever, you do the disciplines over and over again, soon you change your identity and you actually do say, yes, I believe that now I am disciplined. And so that's kind of been the progression uh, over the years from not thinking I was to hoping to become to actually being able to say, yeah, now by the grace of God, I'm very disciplined. Yeah. So you feel like over time, it's just kind of become more natural to you. Like, you know, like you said, if, if you do something over and over again, it becomes, you know, more of your identity, more of your lifestyle rather than you're waking up and you're, you're not really thinking about being disciplined, but it's just kind of become ingrained in, in who you are overdoing it uh, over such a long period of time. Yes. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word natural because again, the natural thing is to not be, but it's more of my identity. It's, 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 um, is now 
more who I am and what I do. So if you, if you want to, you know, what you think about you determines what you do. Right. And if you start to think in a different way about yourself, it impacts your behaviors and your habits and such. And so it really, it is, it's changed my identity, which helps compounding good behaviors over time. Yeah. Well, speaking of discipline, do you feel like, because I feel like for this, you know, in my life, if I think about, you know, whether it's, you know, working out or whether it's um, being in the word or my faith, I feel like discipline begets discipline. So for you, sure. do you feel like do you feel like being disciplined in one area ultimately benefits other areas in your life? A thousand percent. What, what, one of the great books that, you know, if your community hadn't read it yet is uh, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. And, and have, have you read that by chance? Uh-uh. Okay. So in it, it yes, yeah, really good. It's a little bit older book, but he talks about what he calls a um, keystone habit. And it's a fascinating principle that he did. There was a company, I think it was called Alcoa Steel. They brought in a new CEO to help this struggling company. And the new CEO came in and said, we're going to be the safest place to work. Um, And this is my telling of it. I may not get all the details right, but the board was like going, "Uh, okay, we'll follow that. And, you know, week after week, month after month, he just kind of beat the drum. We're going to be the safest place to work. And they thought, well, we got to be profitable. We got to be good. We got to be healthy. But what they didn't realize is that he was creating um, a culture that if we're going to be a safe place, that means we're going to be really thorough in our systems, in our communication, in our follow-up, in who we hire. Basically, this one driving force created a world-class organization that became super profitable. Transfer that to our lives. If there's a, I, I always try to tell people, you know, find one thing you don't like that's good for you and commit to do that one thing. For me, it's flossing. I hate flossing. And so years and years ago, I determined I'm going to be someone that flosses because if I do something that's good for me that I don't like to do, that one little habit, that one little discipline compounds into, okay, I feel more disciplined, therefore I'm reading my Bible, therefore I'm eating better. And and so, yeah, he calls it uh, the keystone habits. There are certain habits that if those are present in your life, they create more in other positive compounding good habits and disciplines. And if those are absent, then they tend to compound negatively. So yes, hundred percent. I agree with you. Yeah. I love that you just said flossing. Cause I honestly feel like you may re- were just speaking to me there because flossing is one of my least favorite things in the world. Yeah, and I every agree. time I floss, man, my gums bleed. I hate going to the dentist specifically just for flossing and for them telling yeah. me you need to start flossing. So I think I'm, I'm really going to take that to heart. And tonight I'm, 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 I'm going to start flossing because I have like, 10, you know, packets of the floss, but I never use them. So get, I get really, the little green, get little green ones that go that, uh, or whatever color white, mm-hmm. whatever, and that have the little floss on there for you and put it in there. Yeah. So you don't have to use two hands and, uh, it's a, it's a flossing hack. See, cause that, that's the thing for me. It's always the two hands, the two hands, it always slips. Yeah. See the two hands is what gets me. So I like that. I'm going to, I'm yeah. really going to take that with me. All right. I'll, next time I, next time we, uh, interact, I'm going to ask you how, how, how are your gums, Christian? Awesome. <laughs> well, 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 we'll talk about it. That's why you have such a good smile. Uh, so for you, you know, at the beginning you talked about, um, how working out and how being physical really turned into a spiritual discipline for you. How do you feel mm-hmm. like, you know, pastoring such a big church, being such a part of the Bible app, um, just all these spiritual things you do, you know, you're obviously you're a man of faith. How do you feel like having the outlet of physical exercise and sports? How do you feel like that impacts your spiritual walk? That's a great question. And I would say that it's really important for me, but it doesn't have to be important for everybody because there's some people, they may have the, for them, it might be reading or it might be some kind of mental discipline or uh, some other form of personal growth. So I don't try to make everybody into an athlete if they're not an athlete, right? Mm-hmm. It, that, that's just, that's not fair. But I think what we want to do is we want to find some area of our life that we have um, a propensity to enjoy. And then we want to we want to not just be great at it for the sake of being great, but anytime we can attach a spiritual value to that, I think it makes it way, way more meaningful. Uh, so my goal is not to be, you know, just the most ripped guy, whatever. My goal is to be the most faithful with what God has given me. Uh, so when I'm 72 years of age, I may not be able to bench press whatever, but it's, I want to be the best um, 72 year old that I can be in health and mind and body, soul and in, in friendships uh, and and whatever. And I just think there's a great if you're a follower of Christ. Um, not just excelling in an area just to 
have pride in it or to be competitive or to make money or to get followers or whatever. But anytime we really see it as stewarding what God has given us, that creates a deeper level of meaning, probably more of a stick to for people and, uh, and a lot more fulfillment along the way. Yeah. So I'm a huge fan of ice baths. I've been taking them for the last six or so months now, uh, ever since I started training for my heavy back squat and my mile that I was attempting to do. Um, I love it because it's great for recovery. I love the adrenaline rush that I get right before I'm about to get in. And I really help, feel like it helps with my mental clarity, my alertness. And I love that, it, that the challenge it presents me. It's uh, difficult. And when you're in, it takes uh, persistence and it takes a little bit of uh, you know, maybe grit to stay under the water. Uh, or in the water because you know that it's going to benefit you in the long run. And this is something that I love incorporating into my training and also just into my lifestyle. But I just got an ice barrel and it's been one of my favorite things that I've gotten to use for training. I love the ice barrel so much because it's uh, it's really convenient. You know, it's just right outside of my back porch. I can fill it with water. I put ice in it and it's so convenient with the spigot on the bottom of it and you can just drain it whenever you want to. And there are so many benefits to cold therapy such as better recovery and performance, improves mood and brain function, it helps alleviate depression and anxiety, it activates the nervous system, it helps with pain management, it reduces inflammation, and it also helps improve your heart rate variability. And I love Ice Barrel because it's such a sleek design. It really looks like I have an old, like rustic barrel in my backyard, and I think it just looks so cool. I also love how I can sit upright in it. Um, I've had temperatures where I've been in other cold tubs in the ice barrel, and when I'm in the ice barrel, just the, the position that I'm sitting in, it does not feel near as cold on my body. And I just think that it helps with my breathing, being able to sit upright. Um, and I also love how it's lightweight and it's portable. And like I said, it drains so easily. And I also love how you can get an ice barrel for as little as $90 a month. It's durable, it's compact, it's made in the USA, and it's also made of 100% recycled material. And I worked with Ice Barrel to help get y'all $125 off so that you can try it out and see if you like it as much as I do. I threw a link in the show notes and you'll see me sharing notes on social media too. You can go to icebarrel.com slash Christian and use code Christian to get $125 off. Ice Barrel offers a 30-day money-back guarantee and 100% satisfaction. Again, that's icebarrel.com slash Christian and use code Christian to get $125 off. Get colder, feel better, and let me know what y'all think. Awesome. Well, I want to kind of segue into, you know, talking about faith. I, I really just had this thought when you were, you know, just talking about that. When you look at you, obviously you... Um, are a good-looking man. You're, you know, you're, 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 you're 55. People are attracted to, not attracted to you, but people are attracted to like your leadership stuff, like just the way that you present yourself. And you know, you, you really have a, a, a go-get mentality. And it, just, just thinking about back to when you were in college, because this is kind of where I want, I want to start this topic. Because you were, you're mm -hmm. the president of your fraternity. So mm -hmm. before you started following Jesus, people you know, we're attracted to you in the sense of wanting to follow you. And now, um, you know, being a pastor, being, being a public figure in the faith, people are still drawn to you and, and, and still attracted to following you. So how do you feel like, you know, pre-following Jesus, do you just always feel like you've had this, you know, th this quality of leadership that people have, you know, wanted to get behind you and really um, valued your opinion on things? Um, mm -hmm. Because it's really cool, like seeing, you know, hearing your story and knowing pre-faith you were, you know, leading your fraternity. And then when you started getting into, into um, you know, when the man handed you the Bible, which I, I want you to tell the story, but you got the guys in your fraternity involved with faith and because they, mm -hmm. they looked up to you. So do you, do you feel like you've always just kind of had that, I don't know, maybe like just that leadership quality that people have, have, have wanted to kind of just follow you? I, I, I would say like, honestly, Christian, I didn't, uh, I knew that I would be in more leadership roles but I never really felt qualified to be there. I always had this massive sense of insecurity. Like, you know, if they think I'm good, I've got them fooled. And so I didn't, I, I knew that I found myself in those roles, but I never, ever felt qualified for them. And I would say, I mean, this is not an exaggeration. I was in probably my mid forties before I found myself saying with confidence, I actually am qualified to help other people become better at leadership. So there, I would just say there was years and years of insecurity. Um, what I'd also say too, is that to, to a lot of people say, well, you're more of a naturally gifted leader and I'm not a naturally gifted leader. I, I would just say that that's anyone who feels like that, they have a very limited view of what leadership is at its core. And this quote is not original to me. I think it was Maxwell who said it, I'm not sure, but what is leadership? Leadership is influence. And everybody has influence. I mean, 
everybody has influence. Some people have mm -hmm. more than others, but everybody has influence. And so if you, if you define leadership as influence, you can influence your close friends, your sorority sisters, your teammates, your uh, classmates, your parents, your bosses, your coworkers, those who work for you. Uh, if you, if you see it as more that leadership is an, is an incredibly spiritual thing that's built on trust. If I can add value to people's life, believe in them, create trust, that increases my influence. And then what am I going to use it for? So long answer to your question is I didn't feel worthy to be uh, like I was really a great leader. And I still feel like I'm not a great leader. I'm an improving leader. But uh, the bottom line is, is you want to you, you want to get to the place where you're talking yourself into understanding that you're in, you have influence and your influence matters over and over and over again. You have influence and your influence matters. And the more you believe that, the more you'll naturally step into leadership roles with credibility and um, and make a bigger difference in life. Yeah, that's really cool. Because even apart from all the leadership stuff you do, you know, even when we were just there a few months ago, just being around you and just your presence, you just feel like someone who's going to take charge and lead. You know, even if you didn't have, you know, your leadership podcast or all the leadership books that you do, just being around you, you just have a presence that, you know, you just feel like you're going to take charge and you're going to lead a movement. You're going to lead whatever you're doing in the room. So that's Thank really you. cool to, to, to hear you say that you battled, um, you know, through those insecurities. Cause that's, I mean, I feel like a lot of people go through that, you know, that's a, especially for men, that idea of just feeling like unqualified. And I right. think hearing you say that, that's, that's it's really cool. So you may you may have read about what's called imposter syndrome, which I don't like the phrase that much because yeah. imposter implies lack of character, and, and it's this syndrome is not a lack of character; it's a lack of confidence in what it is. And then syndrome sounds like a medical condition that you can't change. So anyway, that's aside. Imposter syndrome is very common, and it's especially common in high achievers mm -hmm. because anytime you're a high achiever, you've got a certain level of responsibility, often with an underdeveloped confidence, and so. Though whoever's listening right now who is actually doing a lot and and really making a difference that you feel insecure, that's a common problem that a lot of high capacity leaders have. And what we want to do is really work through in our mindset that we're not leaders because we're good. You know, we're leaders because we've we've we're, we're responsible with it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not not something that you uh, that you ever really deserve. Is something that you you try to steward and, and and own as you go. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, for you, you know, I I mean, I feel like we have such similar stories. You know, we both came to we faith do. in college. Right. Yeah. We had heard the gospel umpteen times before that. Right. For you, when you, you know, when the man handed you the Bible that day in class and mm -hmm. you read it for yourself, what do you feel like for you? Like, what was it th when you were reading that clicked for some like that had never done that before? You know, like what was so, what was the difference when you read that versus hearing it several times before that? What clicked? I I think I was ready. I was you know I was hurting. I, my my sinful nature had caught up to me, and I kind of, kind of was hurting people and was in a was not a person that I was proud of. And then so I always had a belief in God, and like you, I'd heard the gospel again and again. But when I read it was Ephesians chapter two, uh, verses eight and nine. They said that you're saved by grace and not by works. And I thought, wait a minute, you know, it, then it's almost like the whole Jesus was sinless. He died for our sins. He rose again. It's like it all came together for me that, oh, so it, it really is not about me. It was all about him. It was about his grace, about what he did. And the moment that clicked for me, I just felt this, that I, I always felt undeserving, but I thought my, my only reasonable response is to follow the one who did that. And so it just, um, it, it took, it took all the different times I'd heard the gospel and it just, it, my eyes opened to it. I was no longer spiritually blind. I could, I could spiritually see. And, um, probably similar to yours, it was, a you know, it was one of those overnight conversions that was fairly dramatic. Yeah. So for you, it wasn't like, you know, cause even for me after that, it was still dramatic, but there was still a gradual change of, you know, stopping to cling towards the things that, I, that, you know, that I'd clung to for so long. Um, did you have any difficulties, you know, like, oh, what am I thinking of? Um, just putting to death, you know, like in Galatians 5, where it talks, <laughs> in Galatians 5, where it talks about crucifying the sinful nature. Like, did you have yeah, any, like, how, uh, how did you combat that early on as a Christian? I, I was a hundred percent forgiven, but I was not a hundred percent righteous and living and, and still, yeah. still not, not close to that. But no. So, you know, number one, I didn't really know what was right or wrong. 
so I, I changed by Jesus and honest to goodness went out and got drunk with a friend to celebrate. That's how, that's how dumb we were. He, yeah. he was a new Christian. I was a new Christian. Like, oh, let's celebrate. We're Christ-. So that's how dumb I was. And then in dating, when I started dating Amy, who was my first Christian relationship, I had to ask another guy, like, how much can we do? And I want, I want to give me as much as we can because I want to do it all, all this legal, right? And so I just had no, no sense of, um, and, and like, honestly, I came from the party background. I still got drunk multiple times after becoming a Christian, even after I didn't want to get drunk. And so I, just, I battled that and other things as well. And so it's the, the discipleship becoming like Jesus is a process. And the big sins went first. And now the less obvious ones are the ones that torment me daily now. They're not the ones that I'm not hung over the next day from them, but they're the ones that are the inside that are the hardest to crucify right yeah, now, right? For sure. No, but that's yeah. I mean, that's that's so encouraging to hear to me to hear you say that. Cause even like even for me, it wasn't even um, you know, I never I never really struggled with drinking, but my thing was always, you know, pornography. So even after right. even after the conversion, it was like I I knew even even before I started following Jesus, I still knew these things I was doing was wrong. Right. But then after it was like because then, because then I would just feel guilt and shame of being like, well, I'm a Christian and I'm still addicted to this that I was addicted mm-hmm. to before. So it's like, you know, questioning like, did, you know, did this really happen? Did I really change? You know, why am I still battling mm-hmm. with these things that, you know, I battled with before that I, that I thought would be gone? Um, so it's even it's just cool and encouraging to hear you say, you know, those things that you walk through even after confessing, you know, Christ and, and, that, and, and becoming a Christian. And that's such a common problem, especially pornography for someone who totally is forgiven by Jesus. And yet that addiction steam, still seems, seems to linger. And so we have to, we have to have a real consistent ongoing spiritual strategy to combat that particular problem and all the other things that hold us back as well. So that's, you know, I just say to someone listening right now, if you're um, don't let your spiritual enemy bring condemnation that tells you you're not, you'll never overcome it. That it's, that sometimes the, the healing process, it's like, a, it's like a, a broken bone or a wound, What you've got is a spiritual wound from pornography. It's a, a distortion mm-hmm. of your mind or, or lust or greed or anger, or whatever it is. And sometimes it, sometimes God heals you instantly. And sometimes it's a process where he has to heal you and renew your mind. And so don't, don't give up in the battle um, you know, stay in it and the, and the process of sancti- it's sanctification, sometimes three steps forward, two steps back, mm-hmm. but, but it's, um, y- you, you can grow and, and find, um, wholeness and healing if you keep pursuing Jesus. Yeah. So if you've been listening to this podcast for a while now, then obviously you've heard me talk about Athletic Greens before. Athletic Greens is one of my favorite supplements that I take. And especially right now, I need it a lot. The holiday season is in full swing. And last week, we just got back from uh, Thanksgiving with my family down in Florida. And my grandma cooks a lot of food that I need some health along with it. And thankfully, I was able to travel with my AG1 and have a little health boost on the go because uh, when I usually go visit my family, I'm not, I'm not eating the healthiest. And especially when my grandma cooks, I definitely need something uh, that's nutritious that's going to help me out on the go. So what is AG1 though? Well, with one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help start your day off right. And this special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging, all the things. So I personally consume AG1 in the mornings before I go to the gym or really just after I wake up. I like taking it in the mornings because it gives me energy. It helps my gut health throughout the day, and I think it tastes good in the morning. Most green drinks that I've had in the past are bitter. They don't taste well, and athletic greens taste good, and I feel like it gives me the energy that I want in the morning, and I feel like it helps me with my workouts that I do after that. And the awesome thing about AG1 is that it costs you less than $3 a day. So you're investing in your health, and it's cheaper than your cold brew habit. It's cheaper than getting all the different supplements for yourself, and you're investing in an all-in-one nutritional insurance. And like I usually say, you don't have to just take my word for it, but Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews and has been recommended by professional athletes and trusted by leading health experts. And AG1 is also lifestyle friendly. So whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, it falls in your lifestyle. It contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, artificial anything, while still tasting good. So right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into the flu and cold season. It's just one scoop and a cup of water each day. No need for a million different pills to look out for your health. 
And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash huff. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash huff to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Uh, uh, some scriptures that I love, and maybe you, you know, wrestled with these like I did. I kind of combated with these for a while, but I, you know, I love in Romans 6 where Paul's talking about sin and just that idea of like, you know, shall we continue sinning so that grace may increase? And I feel like I thought that for a while, maybe you did as well, but the idea of like, you know, if I'm saved and I go to church and I lead a Bible study, can I, can I still, you know, do these sinful things because there's grace for that? I feel like... Mm-hmm. You know, I even feel like as a culture, I feel like so many people that are Christians just can fall into that mindset. Why do you feel like that's something so easy for us to fall back into? Just that I, because I really do think it's you know it's a, it's an attack from the enemy, just putting a facade around. You know, well, sure. if you're forgiven, you know, well you're hun- like you said, 100 percent forgiven. So let's just go do things and you know ask for forgiveness. Why do you feel like that's such a thing that we as humans wrestle with? I think I think all of us are vulnerable to different things. And so wherever we're most vulnerable is often where we're most creative. <laughs> yeah. Know? So sure. it's uh, it's really easy to to, um, to judge someone else's sin in a different category and justify our own uh, as it is. And so I would just say that transparency matters so so much. I always you know tell my kids and tell I tell myself you know you're only as strong as you are honest. And so we have to be really, really, really honest about where we're vulnerable. And I'm always, you know, shocked at where some other people are vulnerable. Like, going, Dude, that that's your problem? I don't know, that's not a problem for me at all. And then I've got issues that other people don't have either. But when we're, when we're trusting enough in the body of Christ to really not be judgmental, but to be transparent and then to create kind of accountability and, and prayer for each other, the uh, the healing process is worth it, but we just we want to be really careful not to, you know, like if you you say I'm not going to have sex, and well then you have sex. Well, I had sex once, so now I might as well have sex a billion times. Whatever is is that that we don't justify sin, we confess sin, uh, and we continue to confess sin. And, and if we fall back into it, we don't. That doesn't give us permission to keep falling into it. We 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 fall in the grace of Jesus. We accept His forgiveness. We turn. And walk away, and and we have to do some things different, you know. Like, you know, if if someone's looking at porn all the time on their phone, maybe you need a dumb phone, mm-hmm. you know. Maybe you yeah. can't, maybe maybe you can't. And and so in any area, whatever whatever our access is, that's or our friends or whatever is creating the avenue for us to fall into it, we need to redefine or make make changes uh, so that we can become conformed to the image of Christ. Yeah, that's so good. As a pastor, what, what would you feel like is the biggest hurdle or battle that we're kind of facing in in, in our day and age today? Uh, I I'd say maybe ask me a little. Is it an age group? Is it a mindset? What would you? How would you get, get, ask me that a little bit tighter if you don't mind? That's good. Um, I don't know. Make like kind of. I I guess I guess I would say more so. Um, you know, younger generations. I feel like a lot of the younger generations is really what's, you know, influencing older generations now, you know, whether it's through Mm -hmm. social media or through all Mm -hmm. these other platforms, I really feel like the younger voice has a much, has a much louder voice than, than, Mm -hmm. than the older people just, just because Mm -hmm. of social media and because of, Mm -hmm. you know, those different platforms. So what do you feel like, because we were just talking about this on, on the trip that I was just on the idea of like, what would, what would I, what, what would we say that, the younger generation, I guess my generation is kind of struggling with whether it because 20 years ago it might've been X. And then today I would say, sure, I would say it's the whole, my true thing. And I would, I would say that everyone, you know, thinks that they're a version of God because they don't want to be held mm-hmm. accountable. They want to do whatever they want to do, mm-hmm. but then they still have Christian in their Instagram bio, you know? So it's just right. kind of confusing thing. I don't know what, this no, I, yeah, I hear you. So I, if we're taking the younger generation, like let's take Gen Z, uh, like I see a lot of really good qualities in Gen Z that I, I like. They're um, they're less entitled than typically some that are older. They're scrappier. They're um, willing to get in and and um, kind of earn their way. They like to be mentored. They recognize they need help. Some of the challenges, um, the mental health issues that the younger generation is facing, they're just just staggering. Uh, that 
you know, the, the percentage that are depressed, the percentage that are uh, self-harming, the percentage that are suicidal is, is really heartbreaking. So I think we kind of have to try to, and, you know, people way smarter than I am are trying to diagnose the why behind it so we can figure out how to treat it and how to bring healing. And so I've got theories on that and they're just, they're theories. But I think from a spiritual standpoint, I think you're a little bit right. Um, one of the biggest challenges today, there's almost what I'd call TikTok theology. Yeah. You know, what, what everybody else is saying tends to be where we go. And our our um, what appears to be true is either what's most popular or what's loudest. And uh, that's so easy for a generation to get sucked into. If I was that age, I, I would be the same way. And I think what we need to do if we're going to be committed followers of Christ is not be conformed to the patterns of this world, not what just everybody is saying, mm -hmm. not what's most popular, not what's the loudest, but what is most true according to scripture. I think that's a challenge that this generation has because they it's, it's almost hard not to have a both and. Yeah, I want a little bit of my Bible and I want all the rest of this stuff. And all the rest is so loud and so strong and so constant, so pervasive that if we don't figure out how to distance and silence the rest of that so that God's word can stand strong, then we are going to be, we're going to be like synchronistic. We're going to be mixing mm -hmm. scripture with culture more than letting scripture influence how we influence culture. Yeah, for sure. Because yeah, like, like you said, I even asked that question, you know, through the lens of you being a pastor to a congregation of, of that generation. But then again, you have kids that are my age that are, right. you know, that are in that generation that see that every day. So that, that that's cool to hear you say that. One of my, so obviously, you know, the theme of this podcast, um, First Timothy 4, where Paul says, physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. Mm -hmm. What do you think Paul is referring to when he, when he uses that tagline for godliness, or um, when he uses that tagline, godliness has value for all things? Mm -hmm. Well, I thought you were going to ask me about the first part because well, no, okay, you know, I'll ask you about it. What, what do you think yeah, about? No, you, you think can't. It's, it's interesting because, like, when you read the writings of Paul, he's just, he's a lot of metaphors. But you know, some are military. He's just a lot of sports metaphors and mm -hmm. the you know the races and the games. And so it seems like I don't know if he was an athlete or at least he was around. He was maybe. I like a to fan. think. I like to think he was an athlete. I tend to think that if he got beaten the way he did and shipwrecked and snake bitten and came back at least the dude was tough man he was mm -hmm. tough as nails dude was tough man There's he no was doubt a, about it he was a beast he was a beast man he had i mean he was a beast and so uh he talked a lot about you know training and discipline and be you know beating your body to, and and dying your sins i mean he's kind of got some violent metaphors yeah. in uh in the way he approaches things so the part about godliness has value for all i think is a little bit what I was trying to allude to earlier is I, I think for us to really be a light in this world, what we don't want to do is we don't want to separate our life into that, which is spiritual and that, which is physical, or this is spiritual and this is secular, mm -hmm. or this is my spiritual life. And this is my friendship life, my party life, or my professional life. I think the, the spiritual end influences all of it, it that, that, that everything we do is born out of, it's a gift from God that we have the ability. Our, this day is a gift from God. Our, our talents are a gift from God. Our relationships are a gift from God. Our influence is a gift from God. So godliness has value for all in everything, in your studies, uh, in your marriages, in your dating relationships, in your professional life, in your leadership, in your um, physical uh, pursuit of health. And so I think he's just, I think it's a great statement that, that we should take to heart and uh, not try to say, well, that that's not spiritual. Uh, doing your best at your job, that's spiritual. Mm -hmm. Being a um, yeah. being a good friend to someone, that's spiritual. Being generous, that's that's spiritual. Showing up a little early and staying a little late, and uh, and doing everything with as as in uh, unto the Lord, that's spiritual. So, I think that's I, I think that's probably somewhere in the nature of what he was um, trying to convey when he said that. Yeah, I love that because it's I mean it's so true. Like that's something that me and Sadie have been talking about lately. It's like yeah, you can't separate your spiritual life and your, you know, your worldly life or your personal life, you know, so mm -hmm. to speak. So for me, it's like, it's the same thing. It's like with physical training, when I go to the gym, it's like, how can I use this for spiritual? You know, there's been plenty of conversations where somebody's asked me to spot them or I've needed someone to spot me. And then something spiritual comes out of that. You know, this guy, um, he need, he was benching 225, needed me to spot him. Mm -hmm. And he just out of nowhere said, you and my mom are just alike. And I was like, why? And, the, and he said, you both are super spiritual. 
And I was like, well, how do you know I'm super spiritual? And he said, I can just tell just by the way you're mm. doing things. And I was like, wow. so then we got into like a 30 minute conversation and I did have the worldly thought of like, man, like this is a lot longer rest period between these sets than I need. Mm-hmm. But then again, I was thinking like, but this is also why I'm here. You know, it's not just so sure. I can go get, you know, buff and super fit and, 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 and look better, but it's for these conversations because mm. this kid might never go to the, might never go to church, but he's in here, you know, bench pressing. And mm-hmm. if I'm just in here doing my stuff and if I don't have ears to hear that, or if I'm listening to, you know, s- something right. secular, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to have the ears to hear or, or want to have the spiritual conversation. But if I'm filling my mind with, you know, a sermon or uh, something spiritual, if I'm training my body, if I'm training my spirit as well as my body while I'm in there, then right. I'm going to be more prone to have those conversations and they're, they're going to, they're going to just influence me just as much they're going to influence him. So um, 100%. I, I, I love how you said that because it's not both and, or it's not, it's, it's, it's not one or the other, it's both and, right. and how you, right. and how you do those together benefits, yeah. you know, the other simultaneously. It's good. Well, I love, I, I love thinking about, um, you know, because it's like when we, when we were working out the other day, it was just cool to see you go uh, from the church to, to your gym at home and just, you know, seeing your discipline for that. Um, but speaking, but just talking about spiritually, what are some, you know, with you being a disciplined person, what are some spiritual disciplines that you've put into place to really help, um, you know, you lead a church, you lead mm-hmm. uh, your family, you lead your wife, all, all these other things. What are spiritual disciplines that you've put into place to help you train yourself spiritually? So I love, I love that question, Christian. One of the reasons I love it is because oddly enough, as a pastor, I felt kind of like a spiritual failure for years because I didn't have some of the, uh, what I thought were the normal disciplines of what uh, a pastor would be, not even a pastor, but just a strong Christian. And so, uh, for example, my prayer life was real spotty and inconsistent for years. And I know that that's one of the most important things we can do is have fellowship with God. And so people would say, we're going to have a prayer meeting on Tuesday night. Like, I don't want to go to that prayer meeting where I'm holding hands with people and they're praying for way too long about stupid stuff, you know, and that sounds really bad, but I, I didn't want to. No, I, and no I, I agree with that. Okay. Well, you're the other unspiritual guy, right? So I felt real guilt for that. And then when I was first married to Amy, I would be studying all day long scripture. I'd be praying with people. Everything felt real spiritual. And so I'd come home and I just didn't want to do a Bible study with her. And if she wanted to pray, I didn't want to pray for a long time. And so I felt like a real failure. Uh, years ago, I heard someone talking about, I never even found the book. I can't even quote the book, but it, the book talked about um, different pathways to God. And it was kind of revolutionary for me. They, they talked about how different people in scripture connect with God. One way is through Bible study, obviously, that should be a part of our discipline. One way is prayer. That should be a part of our discipline. Some people, they would just experience God best in nature, the glory of creation. And Mm -hmm. if we don't praise him, his creation will shout out his his praises. And one of them was through doing hard work that literally some people just like, for the glory of God, Paul was probably a guy who said, I bring my best every day. And that's one way I connect with God. Uh, Worship is one of the ways that people connect with God. Fellowship is connecting with God. Serving, uh, serving other people is an act of worship and a way to connect with God. So whenever I broadened my idea from my intimacy with God is not just Bible study and prayer, but I gave myself permission to have intimacy in other ways, that was a breakthrough. Then on the my two struggle points, Bible study and prayer, what I found out about prayer was that I don't have to pray long and I don't ever, I, I rarely pray long, long prayers, but now I rarely go a long time without praying. So That's for cool. me, uh, praying is more of short bursts of talking to God, needing God, asking God for wisdom. And even same with Amy, our prayer time is daily, um, but it's not long. And I would say like a little bit goes a long way. A little bit is a lot more than no more. Uh, and so when people are asking me like, how do you pray with your spouse? Because so many people don't, I always say this, I always say, keep it short, keep it consistent. If you miss a day, don't miss two, mm-hmm. keep it short. And people always say, why keep it short? And I like, you don't have to keep it short, but if you start trying to pray an hour, you're probably going to quit. So like, just start maybe yeah. it was what I probably should say, just start. And then keep it consistent. You know, we pray before I leave for the office and then we pray before I go to bed. It's, it's consistent. And then if you miss a day, don't miss two. Uh, yeah. It's a great way to start. Same with scripture. The great news is now with the with the Bible app, you know, it's there's so much more, it's accessible all the time. You could do plans. 
It's really good when your friends can see your plans, you can do it with them. So there's some accountability. Mm -hmm. And so we've got, we've got more tools now to make it work. And I, I would just say this to someone who's struggling, don't feel like you have to conform to what everyone else does. God created you differently. I have six kids, right? And we all, we all connect differently. One of them only texts, one likes to write notes, one FaceTimes nonstop, one of them's only fa face to face. So we're gonna connect with God in different ways. Uh, feel free to be you, connect with God in the way that you do, keep that consistent and, um, and feel blessed to have a very creative expression of, your intimacy with God that's different from other people, and, and then you can maybe have something really special. That's so good. That's so good. I, ju I just had this thought, cause, you know, just hearing, hearing you hearing you say this just kind of made me think, because this is something that I can struggle with. How do you feel like as a man, you know, when you go through those times of, you know, like when your wife wants to pray with you, for instance, and then you don't want to, then you kind of beat yourself up. How do you feel like you kind of get out of that headspace of, you know, telling yourself you suck, you're a loser, mm -hmm. you know, you're not good enough. So what are ways that you've like, I don't know, combated against that or kind of gotten out of the headspace of like, you know, repeatedly telling yourself that, you know, that you're not doing good enough, you're a bad mm -hmm. leader. Um, cause it's, cause for me, it's like, if, if I do something wrong and like say to corrects me for it, I kind of like, I don't like to think that I just mope around, but then I'm just like, just defeated. Mm -hmm. And then she's mad that I'm defeated. So, mm -hmm. so how do you how do you feel like as a man? You kind of you know, like you have the humility to admit when you're wrong, but then you don't kind of just mope in it. But then you get out, then you kind of no, make a difference. This is a it's a really big question. There's like layers and layers and layers of this. So I don't want to be boring and too long winded. But I'd say first of all, sometimes I don't get out of it. Sometimes I get stuck in it, and I start to feel uh, real shame, real guilt. Uh, inadequate, like I'm failing God, I'm not living up to my own expectations, much less God. So I would say that sometimes I don't get out of it. And uh, I, I have to, meaning that yeah. that it's really dangerous not to. So, you know, there's so many different layers. One is we really need to know scripture. And now there is no, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we have to, we have to tell ourselves that over and over and over again. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have to be aware of our sin. We have to confess it, but we, we can't stay stay in it. Uh, and so we, ha we have to be able to, it's really funny, Christian, like when I first became a Christian, I readily accepted the grace of God. Like he saved me from all my wild sins. Now, if I do something I'm ashamed of, it's harder for me to accept the grace of God. We still yeah. need to accept his grace is just as real today. And if we if we don't, um, thank him for his grace and, and uh, avail of his grace where Christ died for nothing. So we have to, re we have to receive the grace. Uh, secondly, I would say this in our marriages, and this isn't only just a, you know, a wife's role in supporting her husband. It would be a husband's role in supporting our, our wives as well is we want to be really careful not to tear each other down, but to really work to build each other up. And mm -hmm. so I would say, like, let's say you're, uh, Sadie does something wrong and you point it out to her uh, and then she lives in shame and you point out it again to her again and again, you're probably not doing as good a job as when she does it right to celebrate that she did it right and mm -hmm. applaud that and praise her for that. Because the more, especially for men, the more we feel like our woman doesn't believe in us, tears us down, doesn't think highly of us, it tends to become a self-fulfilling prophecy that we don't, we, the person who loves us most doesn't believe in us, then, then we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And so I would suck to Amy. There's times where I've said to her, like, I, I am really sorry. I'm probably never going to become that. Meaning like she'd want me to, you know, look into her eyes for two hours and talk about flowers or something. And, and I would say, I, 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 I want to so much, but I cannot be that would you celebrate what I can be? And over time, she stopped trying to help me become what she wanted me to be and instead celebrated how God made me to be. And then suddenly that made me better at it and made her happier. Uh, and so we, we have to be careful not to get into a critical cycle that tears us down, but into a complimentary God-honoring cycle that celebrates the best and builds each other up. And that's not excusing sin in any means. If we do something that's wrong, we need to call each other on it, but we don't, we're not the Holy Spirit, meaning it's not always our job to point, 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 point at the other person we want to do is love and point each other toward Jesus. And so there's a, it takes some finesse 
and and learning how to do it. And how many you've been married? How many years now? Three years. Three years. Last week. Yeah, yeah. three years. Yeah, three. We're not. We're way better at that at thirty, almost thirty-two years than we were at three years. It takes it takes some time to learn each other. Um, you can love each other a lot at three years, and, but the maturity at five, at seven, at ten. It, it it's really it's really special. It gets more special when you do it right. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, thanks. I really needed to hear that, and I'm sure many um all, I'm sure many guys listening to needed to needed to as well. Whether they're uh, in a relationship, engaged, dating, married, whatever it is, guys can be so um you know hard on themselves and so negative on themselves, and just feel like they're not you know they're not doing good enough, they're not leading well enough, or they're you know, not living up to some standard that, that they've set for themselves. So uh, thank you for sharing that. I think that mm-hmm. really is going to help a lot of people. I think it's really thank you. impacted me because yeah, no, that's, that's great. I needed to hear that. Um, well, we're going to, we're, we're going to wrap it up here soon. Do you have any uh, word of encouragement or advice or um, maybe a challenge for someone listening, uh, a guy specifically who's, um, you know, new to the faith, who's been following Jesus for a while. Um, I don't know, just something that, something that maybe came to your mind a word of encouragement or a challenge or something. Yeah, I, I would just I would say kind of to you the same thing a mentor said to me years ago when I was maybe a little bit older than you, Christian, uh, and we were starting the church. A mentor said to me that um, you're you're probably going to grossly overestimate what you can do in the short run, which was so true. And I see this so much in in all age groups, but especially like in um, in your age group and and younger because. Uh, you live in a time and an era where people can become known faster uh, and get mm-hmm. kind of insta influence and go viral. And so there's a lot more opportunity to be dissatisfied with where you are because you see so many people that seem to be so much further ahead of you. And so I'd say that you'll probably overestimate what you can do in the short run. He said, but you'll vastly underestimate what God can do through a lifetime of faithfulness. And I just, I just didn't know how true that was at the time because I felt like such a failure in the early years of the church because it wasn't, we weren't reaching the people I thought we should. It wasn't growing. You know, I felt left behind. I didn't feel good enough. Uh, and, and so I was really um, unsettled about it, felt discontented. But the second part was you have no idea what God can do through a lifetime of faithfulness. So what I would just say to somebody right now is that you're not faithful when you hit your goal in the future, when you hit the target, when you you know, you get married in the future, or you have whatever kind of influence or kind of job or, or what kind of spiritual knowledge, you're, you're not faithful when you hit the goal in the future. You're, 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 su- you're not successful when you hit the goal in the future. You're, you're successful when you're faithful to Jesus today. That's the goal. Be faithful today. Uh, if you're talking about fitness, hey, go to the gym and do 10 minutes today, five minutes today. It, a little bit goes a lot more than, than nothing at all. So in any way, you can be faithful to Jesus. You're calling today. That's your win. And then if you win for enough days, then you've won for a month. If you win for enough months, you've won for a year. If you win for enough years, you've won for a decade. And if you win for enough decades, you got a life and a legacy that really is God honoring. I love that. Be faithful today. Craig, thank you so much for Good joining stuff. me, man. Hey, thank you. Love to you and Sadie, and uh, be careful next Thanksgiving because I heard that um, that some of you, all, like fifty of you, got sick with the stomach bug. Yeah, we stomach all bug we all went time. down for the count and lost lo- lost a little bit of weight because of it. So, uh, so we're, finish we're on the up up. finish finish strong. Fight the good fight. Die to yourself. There's uh, godliness has value for all things, right? There we go. He does. Hey, much love to you.